visiting professorship, the Lisa and Tyler Short lectureship in honor of Lisa Short, who was a farm D and helped us at uh, the old Louisville General Hospital and University Hospital, uh, was a great friend and colleague for all of the surgeons and especially the surgery residents that she helped keep out of trouble uh, for many, many years until her untimely passing several years ago, as well as uh, Tyler Short, uh, the son of Lisa and Carrie, and Dr. Carrie Short is with us here today. Uh, in, in their honor, uh, we have this lectureship each year and invite one of the nation's leading surgical experts to help with your education, and today is no exception. Dr. Barry Inabnet is a native of North Carolina and attended the University of North Carolina undergraduate medical school before residency at Rush, and then did a, uh, an endocrine surgery fellowship in Paris before a long tenure uh, in New York at Mount Sinai, before he became chair uh, of surgery at the University of Kentucky now four years ago. Dr. Nabinet is a, a leading authority on endocrine surgery and uh, metabolic surgery and bariatric surgery. Uh, he's authored over 160 articles in the peer review literature, published nearly 50 book chapters, and has uh, truly uh, led a, a, a new era at the University of Kentucky with a, a really first rate department of surgery. We're uh, greatly appreciative that Dr. Nabnet would be able to come here today and, and many thanks again to the Short family uh, for uh, endowing this lectureship. Dr. Nabnet. Good morning, everyone. Dr. McMaster, thank you for that really warm introduction. And I'd just like to say a few words about your chair. Um, you know, I came, I'm not a, I'm not a New Yorker. You can probably tell by the my accent, but um, coming from North Carolina, but I, I'm new to Kentucky, although my mother is from Somerset. So, and I've operated on a patient um, who knew my grandparents. They're very special, just bizarre. But Dr. Masters really wrote, wrote out the welcome mat and made me feel uh, welcome and um, gave me some information just to, to um, help my transition to from New York to Kentucky uh, be as smooth as possible. So I'm really grateful for that collegial friendship. Um, we also enjoyed his visit as a visiting professor at UK. Uh, I guess it was last year or a year or two ago. Um, also, I'd like to recognize the Short family and thank them for endowing this. I can think of no greater honor than to be invited to give a named lecture at um, a place such as U of L. So I'm really grateful to the Short family. Um, thank you for um, for contributing to this educational endeavor. And hopefully, um, my lecture last night and again uh, this morning will do honor to to Lisa and, and Tyler um, and the rest of your family. And it's nice being Ethan last night as well. Um, so um, anyway, good morning. I have um, no disclosures, but I just will say that my talk this morning. Um, I'm going to kind of scratch the surface on some areas uh, and not dive in too deep because there is a lot to talk about. I mean, some of the things I'm going to talk about are Grand Rounds talks within themselves. But what I wanted to do is provide you with an overview of, um, of some important topics. And um, if you're interested, uh, you can maybe on your own time dive in and uh, do a little bit more research. You can work with Dr. Javi, Dr. Coelho. Uh, and learn more. And I'm sure some of the things I'm going to touch upon will come up in our case presentations uh, this morning. So uh, first, what is endocrine surgery? I mean, I did my fellowship in the late 1990s. And at the time, you may ask, why in the world did I go to France to do training? Um, it was, um, there were no fellowship opportunities in the, in the U.S. at the time. You could go to work with Orla Clark at UCSF and be a research fellow and do some moonlighting on the clinical side. Or you could work with Norm Thompson at the University of Michigan. And that's how you became an endoconservative fellow. Fast forward now, there are 27 fellowship positions and um, it's a specialty that has a, a firm identity around thyroid, parathyroid, adrenal, and neuronic and tumor uh, in the pancreas and other things as well. <clears throat> so it's um, 
it's a wonderful career and um, you can be a general surgeon and an endocrine surgeon. You can do other things. And that's how I sort of fell into also doing weight loss surgery. And that has served me well um, doing both things because when I need to focus on one, I can uh, and, and build that up. I can rely on the other and, and vice versa. So it's just it's like investing. You don't want to have all your investments in small caps. You want to have large cap, mid cap and and um, and large cap all in the same portfolio. So it's just a, something to think about as you're going through your career choices uh, with training. And now there is a group of individuals who are interested in doing MIS fellowship and endocrine surgery fellowships and becoming true metabolic surgeons. So today I'm going to review um, a little bit about thyroid cancer. That's the first maybe half of the talk, because I think that is something that will definitely be on your boards. Um, you'll need to know about this. Um, and I know you already know a lot, but I hope that can supplement your knowledge base. And then we're going to talk about some technology and innovation, primarily around um, new techniques. And um, we'll go into that in more detail. So thyroid nodules. Um, how are you going to work up a thyroid nodule? What are some changes in the cytology and pathology of thyroid disease? Um, and the, the principles of risk stratification um, in treating thyroid cancer. And then sort of the transition and sort of how we approach um, staging. So it's important, obviously, if you have a thyroid mass um, to create a differential diagnosis. And really, there's two things you need to consider. Is the benass, mass benign or malignant? That's the first thing. And does the patient have symptoms? Yes or no. Those two things kind of factor into our decision making on how to work the patient up, whether or not they need an intervention or not. And again, we try not to operate on our patients. I love to operate, don't get me wrong, but we're really trying to go through a pathway to avoid an operation if possible or to get the right patient to the operating room. That's another way of looking at it. So you can see the list of benign conditions there. And then on the thyroid cancer side, papillary thyroid cancer is the most common. That's about 85% of thyroid carcinomas. Then you have follicular cancer followed by medullary cancer. And unfortunately, I don't, I mean, that's a whole day seminar on MTC, one of my true loves, but I'm not going to even touch upon that today for, for the sake of time. And then anaplastic thyroid cancer, which is one of the most aggressive cancers um, in uh, and uh, known to man. I will say, and I probably should have put a slide in about anaplastic, there is some new treatments um, if patients be BRAF positive uh, for anaplastic that can be um, uh, quite remarkable, uh, but something to know about. So when you're working up a thyroid nodule, you, <clears throat> you begin at the very beginning, obviously with the, the history and um, and a family history. Family history is very important in endocrine diseases because there are many familial conditions that can contribute to disease burden. Obviously, physical exam and ultrasound. And I like to say that ultrasound is an extension of the physical examination. We use this in every patient, a uh, head and neck patient comes into the clinic. Very important. The next level of information is around binial aspiration um, with or without molecular uh, characterization of, of the mass. And then finally, uh, the gold standard, of course, is surgical findings. Once you've removed tissue um, and your pathologist can review the slides, you can arrive at a firm diagnosis. Um, and it's important also to really um, effectively communicate the surgical findings because sometimes what's written in a PATH report uh, is not always what happens in the operating room, and that can lead to misunderstanding of actually what's going on with the patient. So here's an example of a patient. This is not a nodule. Um, any idea what this may be? Diffuse enlargement of the thyroid gland. What's on your differential? You see this patient. Any, anyone want to guess? Graves disease. This is a Graves patient. So you can have nodules and Graves, but that's just an you know a, a full symmetrical gland. Here's obviously a lymph node, uh, a level five lymph node, and these are just important things to look for. Uh, on your physical examination. So how do you work up a thyroid nodule? Well, you want to begin obviously with your examination and, um, and all you really need is a TSH. Uh, you don't necessarily need a free T4, or T3 levels. I mean, they, they, they can be helpful, but a TSH will tell you what you need to know. If the TSH is suppressed, then that takes you down a pathway of hyperactivity. And, and that's really the only indication nowadays for um, an uptake scan. Uh, if you have a functioning nodule or nodules, <clears throat> with the exception of Graves, you don't really need that to diagnose Graves disease. Um, and that'll take you down that pathway. But if it's non-functioning, if, if the TSH is, is normal, 
or elevated, uh, then that's going to take you down a pathway of um, getting an ultrasound and an FNA. Now, here are my colleagues. I love this picture of Dr. Lee. She's the, the, the head of our endocrine surgery program at University of Kentucky. Um, she's from Texas, and she is um, an excellent, excellent, busy surgeon. Um, we have Dr. David Sloan, um, upper left, and Dr. Oliver Fackelmeyer. Um, he joined us from UCLA a couple of years ago. Well, this just shows ultrasound. This is actually our clinic. Um, and um, you need to know the normal anatomy of the thyroid gland. So obviously, um, trachea, the thyroid gland, the carotid, the strap muscles, the intradrugular vein, uh, and uh, the esophagus um, is, is important to, to visualize. Ultrasound is really important because... Um, many specialists, and, and I'm not primarily on the ENT side, don't really have training in um, ultrasound, um, and they rely on technicians and radiology, but it actually is really important because when you are doing an ultrasound, you can actually show things to the patient and have a highly informed discussion about outcome of their, uh, of their operation and let them participate in decision-making, and they actually really... Uh, start to understand, perhaps have a better understanding of things. And then you can also um, obviously look for lymph nodes. And then now we can also do transcutaneous uh, vocal cord assessment and forego the need for flexible laryngoscopy um, in, 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 select papers, in select patients. So <clears throat> when you're performing ultrasound, there are certain things that are more indicative of, of cancer and, and some that are more indicative of benign. But here's an example of some of the things we see, um, you know, uh, uh, poorly circumscribed uh, nodule. Um, you can see those little speckles, those white dots, we call those punctate calcifications. That's a sign of cancer. It doesn't mean cancer, but it certainly is a risk factor. Um, and a solid composition as opposed to a nodule that has a spongiform appearance that usually is benign. Um, you can see taller than Y. Um, this clearly it looks highly suspicious for malignancy on ultrasound. <clears throat> and you'll note though also down here, Here's the esophagus. So you'll have a discussion with the patient about recurrent laryngeal nerve involvement because this actually is a budding where you know the recurrent laryngeal nerve is going to run. Whereas if you have a rim of normal thyroid tissue there, you can reassure the patient that the mass is probably not involving the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And, uh, and then in the lateral neck, here is um, the thyroid gland, here's the carotid. And then you can see this is a clearly a highly suspicious node for metastatic disease with punctate calcifications. And, um, Whatnot. We also have it set up to do cytopathology uh, in our clinic, which is really important because many of our patients come from hours away. They come to the big city of Lexington and um, it's traumatizing for them. They don't know where to park and it's just, it's, um, we want to provide a service. So this is a busy slide, but there are two classification systems for ultrasound. Uh, the tyrides classification, which is what radiologists use. It's a point system. You get a point per characterization and you add up the number of points and that gives you a tyrads, obviously four and five, the higher the tyrads classification, the smaller the threshold or the lower the threshold for doing um, a tissue biopsy. Um, and then on the right is what most of us use uh, on the surgical side, which is the American Thyroid Association classification. It's kind of more subjective, you know, low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, a sort of a gestalt feeling. And there obviously there's things in those boxes that help you. Now, just be aware that once you start needling things, you often go down a path of needing an intervention. <clears throat> I saw a 28-year-old um, a couple of weeks ago who had uh, an 11 millimeter nodule that was biopsied by radiology, interventional radiology, and they sent it off for molecular testing and it came back suspicious. So here you're stuck with a very low risk potential cancer in a young patient. And, and we actually, in that patient recommended surveillance. Um, she's okay. And I can see her six months. We have a lot of patients in the surveillance pathway. It grows, it comes out. So that gets me next to cytology, a uh, really important um, part of the workup. And, and this is, um, is wide open. So you've heard of the Bethesda classification. Basically before 2010, it was sort of the wild, wild west of terminology. Um, you, you know, if you had a biopsy at Louisville, it would be different than the language that, that in Kentucky or Cincinnati or anywhere in the world. It's just the words were there, but it depended on, you know, you needed to know your set of pathologists and what their language meant. So there was a consensus conference that met in Bethesda, i.e. the Bethesda classification. 
And they came up with some common standard language about how to classify um, the thyroid nodule or the cytology. And there's six categories. Uh, and this is my favorite question for students and residents because they often don't remember this. Uh, but one's inadequate, two's benign, three is, is uh, uh, atypical cells, uh, AUS or follicular lesion of undetermined significance. FN is follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm. Five is, is uh, suspicious for cancer and, um, and six is malignant. And with each of these categories, there is a ROM or risk of malignancy. So you can sort of say, okay, if you have a Bethesda two, you have a blank risk of cancer. So that was updated um, in 2019. And you can see the, the updates here. Basically after 15 years of collecting data, um, we arrived at the fact that actually um, there's a little bit of adjustment uh, in these characterizations. Um, Non-diagnostic actually is higher um, and the AUS, FLUS is higher as was the Bethesda floor classification. Now these are ranges. I remember seeing a patient in New York who had a Bethesda five classification and an ultrasound feature with punctate calcifications and a three or four centimeter mass. And I said, this is a cancer, I'll bet the farm on it. Um, and so we did a total thyroidectomy and it came back benign. And I was flabbergasted. So it turns out her brother um, is a well-known endocrinologist in California who had been on 60 Minutes uh, talking about sugar. So the stakes were pretty high. So we went back. I just thought something was wrong. We got something mixed up in the specimens, and we, we found out she had had a parasophageal hernia done um, a few years before. So we went and got that tissue, and we did um, a genetic analysis, uh, matching DNA matching, and it was her tissue. So then I could tell her that it was benign. So I tell you that story that nothing's 100%. These are ranges, and it's not perfect. Uh, but it gives us a level of information that allows us to make informed decision making. Um, this is a study that we conducted, I conducted and led uh, a few years ago, um, looking at um, data from three uh, registries. I've been very involved with setting up the US registry, SESQIP, um, but um, a couple of European registries, uh, the British, and then uh, this is from over 250 countries, or sorry, 250 uh, hospitals in 15 countries, ultimately uh, 44 plus thousand um, results. Um, I submitted this work to American Surgical and it was not accepted. I was kind of surprised because it's sort of an important paper, but we ended up with 21,000 um, FNAs. And uh, this was just before the Bethesda, the, the second edition had come out. And we saw that the, the rates were actually much, much higher than uh, with the first edition. Uh, this is for our first, you know, um, uh, acknowledgement or awareness that the, the rates were a little bit off. They were higher than, than, than we thought. Uh, but keep in mind, these are patients that are referred to a surgical practice. There's a little bit of bias built into the data set. These are patients that were referred to a surgeon and then evaluated. So already there's selection bias in here in the patient population. But we started to tease out some important characteristics. For example, um, this is a heat map looking at age and gender. <clears throat> and if you look at uh, young men uh, from the age of 35 to 45, you can see that the, the rate of malignancy for a Bethesda 3 nodule is much, much higher uh, in that subgroup of, of patients than uh, we ever thought. So um, really interesting um, information. And then just a couple months ago, um, the, the third edition uh, was released. And the main update is they try to simplify the language. They got rid of uh, FLUS and SFN to again, make it a little bit more streamlined, the language. And then uh, the ranges, they give a, uh, an, a mean rather than a range in addition to the ranges. And you can see that, again, the, the Bethesda one and two categories are a little bit higher um, in keeping with the study that we did um, and published in 2020. So you need to know about the Bethesda classification if you're going to uh, be involved with our cancer. Now, the genetics of this, this is a whole grand rounds in itself, and I'm far from an expert uh, in this, although I need to have some basic knowledge of, of this because uh, it's rapidly evolving. Um, but what we've been able to understand ever since BRAF was uh, discovered and first reported in 2003, um, there's been a lot of work on 
using molecular profiling or molecular characterization of tissue to, again, determine benign versus malignant um, before surgery. And now there are implications actually after surgery with this information about how we treat some patients. So there are four commercially available products. These are the three most. Rosetta is the fourth one, not in the slide. Um, we actually use a firma. Um, when I was in New York, we used ThyroSeq, and I came to Kentucky and had a firma. I was like, that's fine. You know, they're, they're all a little bit different, but they use mRNA and DNA technology to basically look at um, mutations to help characterize um, the nodule. It's really only indicated for Bethesda 3 and 4. In fact, if you, the way it works, you, we, you do a biopsy, our cytopathologists come to the clinic, and it uh, usually takes them four minutes to arrive. So we have a patient, we're doing a biopsy, they read a Bethesda 3 or 4, and we're like, then we talk to the patient, okay, let's send this off for genetic testing. So we have to do another pass uh, under ultrasound guidance, and then we basically send that to the company. They will not, they didn't read the slides, and if they read it as a Bethesda 2, they won't run the study. So it's only for Bethesda 3 and 4. And they give you information, and basically the, the concept is that the mutations can characterize a nodule as high risk, intermediate risk, or low risk for malignancy. And that really determines surveillance, diagnostic lobectomy, or perhaps total thyroidectomy in your management of the patient. That's the concept. Um, and to dive down just a little bit deeper, this is thyroseek. You can see that uh, each of these categories has an associated risk with it. Um, and uh, the, the RAS mutations, uh, really lead to um, a follicular pathology. They can be in follicular adenomas. They can be in NIFT-P, which is uh, formerly wasn't considered a cancer, but the classification changed in 2016. It's um, in a non-invasive capsulated um, follicular uh, papillary tumor. Um, or you can have a, a BRAF-like mutation, uh, which is intermediate risk. And then there are some other high-risk mutations like TERT uh, that can actually... Um, lead you to think the nodule is more high risk. Now, often, if you have, for example, a TERT mutation, that nodule on ultrasound is going to look angry. It's going to have features that heighten your suspicion of, of trouble, of an aggressive tumor, and that's going to really determine what you do. So ultrasound in conjunction with cytology, in conjunction with molecular profiling, is important in making decision-making. And I gave you an example of the 28-year-old that I'm observing with uh, an intermediate risk mutation. Um, and she was comfortable with that, uh, with that plan. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, it's very important in surgery to communicate your findings clearly in a synoptic operative report, um, because often a pathologist will read the margin as positive, but all gross disease has been resected. And so that can lead to um, confusion when you're, say, a year later going back to look at the record and you don't remember the, the conversation you may have had or the discussion, getting this clearly documented is important. And, and also, um, it helps with tumor boards discussion. Uh, and I know that um, you, you, you now have a very active tumor board here uh, that Dr. Javid has helped bring together. And um, that, that's a work in itself, but very important for delivering optimal patient care. Now, staging begins. Um, there's kind of three things, the TNM, um, the ATA risk stratification, and then the um, ATA response to therapy, and it's sort of a continuum. So one, this is a pretty big change uh, in 2010 uh, to 2018, uh, the, the, the new um, eighth edition of the AGCC uh, staging arrived. And I am gonna ask another question. So here's a 62 year old female uh, with pretty aggressive disease, a big, well, uh, Bethesda 6 nodule underwent a total thyroidectomy, had lateral neck disease, underwent a, a modified neck dissection with positive lymph nodes, has a postoperative thyroid volume level that's elevated, indicative of ongoing disease, and was found to have uh, extensive metastatic disease on um, ancillary imaging. So what stage is this patient? Stage four. Okay. Stage four. Now you have a 38-year-old female with the exact same findings. What stage is this patient? Four. Stage four. Anyone else? Somebody. Don't be bashful. 
Stage two. So that leads me to the next question. What is the most influential element in uh, staging well differentiated thyroid cancer? Age. This is a board question, and it's commonly missed. Uh, our residents rotate through endocrine surgery third years. By the time they're fifth year, they often forget this. So it's really, really important to remember age is critical. Now, I have a hard time with these tables. I know, Dr. McMaster, this is your thing. This is like these tables. They're, this is very confusing, but this is the, the new classification. Uh, the TNN, but if you look at this, you're like, wow, what does this really mean? Um, I'm going to try to simplify this. But you see age, it was 45, now it's 55. Uh, so over, you know, 20 years of collecting big data and analyzing data, realized that actually um, age uh, could be moved from 45 to 55. So what happened to, you know, if you were in the age category and you're malignant and then not malignant, you still had cancer. You don't go back and reclassify folks who already had a classification. Uh, but I'm going to try to really simplify this. So if if you're under 55 <clears throat> and you have thyroid cancer, any findings, you're stage one. It's pretty clear. Lymph nodes, extra thyroidal extension, big tumor, doesn't matter, stage one. If you're under the age of 55. If you have metastases, you're stage two. That's it. If you're under 55. So it's pretty, pretty simple. If you're over 55 and you have a small tumor less than four centimeters, you're stage one. A big tumor with any lymph node, stage two. Stage three is if you have extra thyroid extension into the strap muscles or surrounding structures. And then stage four is some metastases. So that's a good way to, um, to think about this. Now, the risk of recurrence, um, also there are things we look for um, that heighten or lessen the suspicion of recurrence. And there's been some really important changes. So you, you think if you have lymph nodes, you're gonna be high risk, but actually not all lymph nodes are created equal. If you have five or less lymph nodes, you're in a low risk category. And that has implications of whether or not we decide to get radioactive iodine or not. And, the, and there's an active debate in tumor boards about, about this. Um, if you have a big lymph node, one lymph node that's three centimeters or more, then that's considered high risk. And you're gonna see that on ultrasound. You're gonna know that really going into your operation. You're not gonna be surprised. You should never go into an operation to be surprised if you've imaged the patient properly and so forth. You can see the list of things here, but we each of these categories has an associated risk of recurrence of disease. And this is important because the higher the risk, the more aggressive your therapy, whether it's surgical or post-operative therapy, the radioactive iodine, and the more tight your surveillance will be. So this is really important to understand uh, how you categorize uh, the risk of the patient. And then finally, we look at the response to therapy. An excellent response means that you have no detectable disease uh, on imaging or um, on biochemical analysis. Um, incomplete biochemical response means you have no evidence of structural disease, but you have a detectable thyroid globulin level. And again, you're going to heighten and tighten up your surveillance and work off of that patient. Um, rather than see them every year, you may see them every four months, for example. Um, incomplete structural response means there's either um, persistent disease or new disease that has occurred and, um, and that needs to be treated. And then finally, um, and, and indeterminate means you don't really know what's going on. The, the stuff's confusing and you just have to follow those patients carefully. So um, this picture, Dr. Mike Tuttle from Memorial Sloan Kettering is a very good friend. He's an endocrinologist, but is a, is a world authority of thyroid cancer. And uh, that's Michael Ye. They, they were in a cab together and coming from a meeting and, and they start talking about risk stratification and whatnot. And, and Michael said, well, it's like, it's like a photograph that's blurry. And then the, the, the more clarity there is, the more focused you get, uh, that's when you have your kind of your final clarification. That's your histopathology and your ultimate diagnosis. So um, I, I didn't know this until I was researching the study. Actually, Mike wrote this up and, and it's the focus of Ye. And he actually published this. So this is actually in the literature. And that's where the focus of Ye comes in to be. But it shows you that now rather than having come in, getting staged, and then you're, that's your stage, staging is an ongoing process. It kind of is logical and makes sense. It's a dynamic process where you re-evaluate the patient and you can restage them based on what's going on with the real-time information. Certainly logical and makes sense. I think it's been a major advance uh, in the management of thyroid cancer. Now, several of those topics I've, I've brushed over are, I said, like I said, grand round talks within themselves. So I just wanted to give you sort of an overview 
And I'm going to move on now and talk a little about, about some advances in technology. Now, nerve monitoring is not new. Um, it's been around for over 20 years or more, uh, but it's important to know um, how to use it and how to answer this on your oral boards because um, it will be something that is, is in play. Obviously, the vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve. Uh, from that comes the recurrent lingual nerve. On the, on the right, it loops around the aorta. On uh, Sorry, the left. On the right, it goes around the subclavian artery. And, um, and then you have the superior lingual nerve. It's the external branch, which supplies the cricothyroid muscle, which if damage can lead to a change in tone or strength of the voice and is a, a devastating injury for uh, a performer or a public speaker. Um, so we use nerve monitoring, and it's important to note um, that this is a tube, it's placed, there's electrodes on the tube, and um, you use that to basically evoke an action potential in the vocalis muscle, which causes the vocal cord to move, and that movement's detected by the, uh, the electrodes, and that comes out as a, as a signal, both auditory and um, you can measure the actual amplitude uh, of the nerve conductivity. So you can... Um, we use this in a variety of ways. The, the classic way is to test your vagus first, and you want to test at the base of the neck uh, because um, on the right side, you can have a non-recurrent lingual nerve. And with that, the, you have a replaced right subclavian that runs, comes off the aortic arch and goes behind the esophagus. So there's nothing for the nerve to recur around. So it's called a non-recurrent. Uh, comes right off the vagus in a different variety. So if you test the vagus on the right, and there's no signal, either the tube's in the wrong location, uh, there's a power problem, a connection problem, the patient got paralytics, or you have a non-recurrent. And so you have to kind of go through that stepwise. So we test the vagus always to make sure everything's working. Um, it's important to know you don't use nerve monitoring to find the nerve. I have seen surgeons get paralyzed using the nerve monitoring equipment trying to find their anatomy. You, you, you need to know how to find your anatomy safely then you confirm that with nerve monitoring. And so that's what R1 is. So you identify the recurrent lingual nerve, you test it to make sure that R1 signal is present. You do your operation. And yes, you can map out a little bit here and there um, during your lobectomy or total thyroidectomy. But at the end of your procedure, you do R2, you test the nerve. Uh, and then finally you do V2, you test the vagus. If V2 signal is present, the nerve is working. So if the patient has a voice change after surgery, um, and V2 is present, and I document this very clearly in the op report, so you can go back and look. Um, you can say, listen, this is uh, inflammation or some other reason, um, and, and give the patient some reassurance. If you lose signal during the nerve, during the operation, we will often stage the procedure. Um, and there's some experience nuances in that, but if you're planning to do a total thyroidectomy um, and you lose signal, uh, particularly in something like Graves disease, those are a little bit harder operations, you may back off. Um, and uh, it's a stretch injury usually, and then allow for recovery um, and then bring them back and do the contralateral side um, when, they, um, when the uh, other cord is, is recovered. And why do you want to do that? Because the worst thing you can do is um, have uh, the patient get a tracheostomy. If both vocal cords are paralyzed. It's possible they could get a trach. Now, no one time we did an operation and the resident said, do you want to put local in? I said, sure. Go ahead. I went out and talked to the family, came back. Both nerves are intact. And we excavated the patient's chest drier. I was like, I, I was dumbfounded. I didn't know what had happened. Actually, she didn't tell me she was doing the local. That's what it was. She did the local, and, the, and I was dumbfounded. So we took the patient to the unit, reintubated, and um, and then the rest is like, Dr. Navin, I think I put local in. And a lot of local went into the operative field and, and anesthetized the nerve. So then we we activated the patient you know, six, seven hours later, and the patient was fine. Uh, but just beware, if you're using local anesthesia, you can't actually anesthetize the recurrent nerves. And if you get both of them, uh, you can have, have a problem. Um, this is a paper that was presented by Peter Angelis' group from the University of Chicago at American Surgical uh, two years ago, and just showing uh, the benefit of nerve monitoring that, um, and actually, you know, we say, oh, you have a 1% chance of nerve injury. It's actually much higher. Um, you know, we, it's more like five to, to 8% uh, is more of a more realistic um, uh, rate. So that that's one thing I took from this paper, but just shows that nerve monitoring can help reduce the nerve injury rate. Now, this is a patient that came to see me at UK from afar. 
Um, she had a Bethesda 5 nodule, so highly suspicious. It looks suspicious. And actually, it went down below our clavicle, so it was a pedunculated nodule. And uh, as it turns out, uh, she's from the state of Kentucky, and her husband is one of the leading malpractice attorneys in Kentucky. So um, with some difficulty, I delivered the nodule. I had a spoon and my finger, and you, know, you don't want to pop into it because that will see the, the area, but um, we got it up and I found that the recurrent nerve was actually uh, invaded um, by the tumor. So I drew a picture, put the date and time, and I took the date out so there's no identifier for you. And um, and then went out and said, listen, this is what I found. This is what I need to do. And I'm going to divide her nerve to get this tumor out. <clears throat> and, um, and so there's a nerve going into the mass uh, on the left uh, right here. Here's the nerve. And then um, because actually this had been longstanding, there was actually a lot of, it stretched the nerve. There was a lot of uh, nerve for me to work with. I actually was able to do a re So uh, using six of prolines, so the nerve back together, did a little wrap around it. And um, actually her voice function um, came back after about six months. You don't get normal vocal cord function. And I did the other side. This is not something on stage. I, I did a total thyroidectomy with, with great trepidation and caution on the other side. Um, but she was so grateful she has endowed, she and her husband have endowed um, a lectureship at UK uh, about thyroid education. And Dr. Tuttle was our first speaker. So really um, a pretty cool story. And here's the specimen. You can see this is all below her clavicle. Uh, really fascinating. But her, her lobe was normal. This little stalk here and then this big nasty tumor um, uh, that uh, was below her clavicle. What about advances in technique? Uh, well, um, I don't do RFA, that's a disclosure, um, but it's something I need to know about. And it's probably something we need to start doing, but we're so busy, we don't know. I, I see some head shaking from my endocrine colleagues there. We don't know how to introduce this in our practice because it does it is time consuming, but it is important. And there's a variety of different ways to ablate tissue that have been around for more than uh, a generation. Really, probably liver has is, is, is led the way. Um, I did have a, uh, a video of an insulinoma recurrence that I operated on in New York, and we uh, did alcohol ablation of a recurrent insulinoma. I, I took it out for the sake of time. Uh, but in thyroid cancer, um, you know, this is not a new concept. Ian Hay from Mayo Clinic, uh, 20 plus years ago, has been a champion of alcohol ablation of, of lateral neck disease in the recurrent neck important work. Um, and you can see a small nodule, small recurrence. You know, you don't want to go back and reoperate on, on this and doing a tissue ablation. But now with the um, advanced technology, really led by our Korean colleagues, um, and this is something that's, that, that's now in the armamentarium. And actually, in researching this, this topic for this presentation, I mean, there's a gazillion articles now on RFA. Um, I've been trained. I just can't get started. It, it's just, it's painful. Um, so you, you, you use a probe to go in and out of the nodule and you ablate it. Now, why? It's obviously minimally invasive. Uh, you avoid anesthesia. Um, it's ambulatory and um, it's safe. But who should be doing this? Our IR physicians are salivating. Uh, and I'm not in any way disparaging them. They do great work, but they really want to get involved. We're concerned that they will start doing this in the wrong patient. And so try not to put any too many obstacles in place. Uh, we've put a protocol about presenting cases at tumor board, having an informed discussion, and then making sure the right patient's undergoing the technology. And that's sort of the approach we've decided to take. But I do think we um, need to start doing this in the office setting. Um, it, it's pretty easy. We do our own FNA. It's pretty easy to do. If you can do an FNA, you can do this. It just takes 30 minutes to an hour to perform. And that's, you know, that's, that's a lot of time in a very busy clinic to stop. Uh, to do this, you'd probably have to have a special day that's an RFA day. Um, and, and they've started to expand um, as experience has grown, um, doing micro PTCs and even some small low temperature thyroid cancers. You basically put the patient in the supine position, you get lidocaine, you can do hydro dissection to get the carotid separated from the thyroid gland, and, and you do a medial to lateral approach. You go from the middle of the neck towards the lateral. Um, and you have to kind of do the moving shot and pull technique where you, you move the, the probe in and out. This is the triangle of doom. Um, this is where the esophagus and the recurrent lingual nerve reside. So you want to make sure that you're very careful in that area. And here's just a schematic of, um, uh, again, of this, of this technique. Um, it's safe. Uh, there have been reported complications. And 
in researching this talk, there has now been a reported death. And I, I'm not surprised. I mean, I've seen patients that have had FNAs that have had horrific uh, outcomes and then who came to, to be evaluated for further, uh, further management. Um, so I, I applaud these authors for publishing this. And this is important. If you have a bad outcome, don't hide it, particularly with new technology. You want to report that outcome, let others know about it so they can understand and prevent that from happening to the next patient. This is a case report of a death uh, from an unrecognized hematoma where the patient came into the ED and basically um, and died. Now, there is a, a large position paper published in 2022, and there is a position statement uh, that is in press, I understand, from the American Thyroid Association that will really help provide clarity uh, about the do's and don'ts and the indications and so forth. But this technology is here to stay, and we just worry that um, this could be a marketing ploy, it could be used like any other like a gimmick and, and be done on the wrong patient. So we just want it to be done correctly in the right patient. Now, finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about remote access surgery. And I was a new attending in 1998. I've been in practice for five months and we did the second uh, transcervical endoscopic thyroidectomy in the world. Now, I was the co-surgeon. I was not the lead surgeon. It was my division chief at the time, Michelle Gagné. And I don't know if this is going to allow me to play, but I just wanted to, if this plays, let's see. Yeah, so you can see we did it almost like uh, a tap hernia repair. Um, this is a patient with a herpal cell neoplasm. Um, and we used the scope uh, to kind of create the, the working space put three millimeter instruments in, and it's a little grainy because this is from uh, 25 years ago. It's hard to believe. Um, and I was six months into my first job doing some crazy stuff. So um, here you can see the dissection. There's a parathyroid gland being preserved. Here's the recurrent lingual nerve. Um, not quite using energy at this time uh, for all the vessels. So there's some clips there, recurrent nerve being dissected. And um, Superior pole was then divided with um, a clips and an energy device. There's a recurrent nerve and then the ligament of Barry. The isthmus is divided. And then you can see that the this is the hardest part of the operation was putting it in a, in a retrieval sack, but um, it was extracted and um, people just went wild with this. I mean, you know, we didn't do any publicity, but the word got out and we started seeing all sorts of patients who wanted um, this type of operation. But you know what? It ultimately did not work so well. Um, I ultimately did about 75 of these cases, a little less than 100. And, you know, just it, it wasn't really ready for prime time. Um, and But I gained a lot of experience with this. So then um, what, what happened is in Asia, um, our Asian colleagues went wild with this. Um, they started doing all sorts of different techniques. This is from 2002. And you can see just four years later, all the different techniques that were uh, being attempted and developed uh, in Asia. Now, these are the techniques that I've been most involved with. <clears throat> the endoscopic work, transcervical approach, a transaxillary approach, the BABA approach is the breast and axillary approach. And this is the dates where I first performed these. And I was not the developer of these techniques, but I was an earlier adopter uh, and maybe the second or third in the U.S. to do these type of, this type of work. So this is um, the transaxillary approach. I was a visiting professor at Korea, the World College of Surgeons in Korea, 2009. And they're like, would you like to come to the operating room? And I was like, absolutely. So I went to Yonsei Medical Center and they had three rooms going, three robotic cases at once, uh, 12 to 15 cases a day of transaxillary thyroidectomy. I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. So um, I did some cadaver work. And at the time we were using a robot. So um, you needed a special retractor. It's called the Chung retractor. Chung is a surgeon, it's the Yonsei who developed the technique. And um, the company flew the retractor, went to Texas first, because there, there didn't exist in the US. And so a surgeon in Texas did the first transactional case. Then they flew it to New York. I was at Columbia University at the time. Uh, same retractor, uh, we sterilized it. And then I did the second. And then I started doing, um, you know, robotic transaxillary thyroidectomy. The problem is I couldn't get access to the robot. This is a problem we still face today. 
with access. So I started just doing it endoscopically um, without a robot and then started modifying it and making periolar incisions and ultimately did several hundred cases this way. Um, tried different things like this is a, uh, I don't know if this is the first or second generation spider um, device, a table mounted device that would allow you to not have to have a robot. Uh, it's actually disposable. And this just shows you um, kind of the type of innovation we were trying to do as we were developing these techniques and trying to modify them. You can see that the motion's a little bit clunky. Uh, it's not like the intuitive system nowadays and some of the competing products are coming on, on, this, on the scene. But um, ultimately, um, I was doing a lot of these cases. So um, I was working at one of the Mount Sinai hospitals um, with a, a PGY4 who had never seen this before. And um, I went down to talk to the family after we were done. And the resident called me back and said, Dr. Navin, there's swelling. Is that normal? Um, and I said, no, that's not normal. So here you can see the patient's extubated because you can see the mask here. You can see all the swelling. And so um, we, we reintubated the patient. We were able to get the patient asleep. And so things happen with any thyroid operation. Um, but we were able, you know, this is a big space. You make a huge, big pocket there. So it's not like they're going to have airway compromise. Um, you can see that the, the, the uh, retractor has this little rim here that we actually hook a suction device up for aspirating the heat and smoke out. And I actually reverse engineered that and we irrigated with that, made a little rain shower to irrigate the um, operative field. We found that there was a small uh, bleeder uh, from the IJ because this is a, a technique where you split the head. You don't divide, but you split the head of the, of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and uh, and come in over on top of the IJ and then and then do the operation. So this, I think I even sent this patient home the same day. We were doing outpatient surgery. Uh, she was observed and she did she did very well. So I started traveling like all over the place. I've been blessed to have lots of invitations um, to interact with colleagues. And I always learn more from these interactions than I ever can, can give. And Dr. McMasters can probably attest to that. I've always learned from these meetings. Um, and so this is a meeting in Shanghai, but I started to see things like this is like a modified paper clip being used to perform a central lymph node dissection. This is in 2010. And here they're doing a, a modified neck dissection uh, for thyroid cancer. Um, I was the only um, Westerner at the meeting. The meeting was in Chinese, but uh, thankfully um, the video is a video. So you can still learn and understand. And I had a lot of high level discussions, lots of ideas. So ultimately um, we were successful in recruiting Hyun Sa. Um, he's a Korean American. He immigrated to the U.S. when he was 11. He grew up in Auburn, uh, Alabama. He's a, he's a war eagle. Um, loves, loves, loves the Auburn football team. And um he went over to Korea um, to do, after he finished his fellowship at NGH, to do a fellowship uh, for six months. And then we recruited him to, to join us uh, at Mount Sinai. And he did uh, in 2015, uh, the first robotic BABA in the US. So here I have a recruit who's now teaching me um, how to do things. And we just had a, a, a great uh, run in New York. This is an approach where you make incisions around the areola of the breast and in the axilla. And you make, basically make a huge working space. And that's time consuming because you have to create this working space here. And then you enter the neck and you basically you do the operation from the bottom to the top. You start by um, separating strap muscles. You divide the isthmus. Um, you mobilize the thyroid gland that's dividing the isthmus. You find the recurrent lingual nerve low in the neck and dissect it up uh, superiorly. And then you end up with the uh, superior pole as the last thing you end up with. Um, and then you divide the superior pole vessels. Um, with this, you can do much bigger. We were doing you know, bilateral disease, uh, bigger nodules, uh, lateral neck dissections. Dr. Suss started doing that. It's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but he was able to do uh, lateral neck dissections this way, really pushing the envelope, doing great work. Uh, and you can see um, uh, this is a, a early post-operative uh, picture with fairly, uh, really good cosmetic result. The incision here on the side is really in the fold. We are very careful to place it in the fold of the axilla. So <clears throat> if you can approach the thyroid gland from the south, um, why could you not approach the gland from the north, uh, from the other direction? So uh, then therein lies the, the transoral thyroidectomy, uh, which it, it, at first glance seems kind of bizarre and crazy, but this is a true natural orifice operation where 
you go through the oral vestibule to get down to the, the, the cervical space. The Germans tried behind the tongue and uh, to their credit, they published this extensively and largely just wrought with complications as one might imagine. Uh, and this is a whole presentation in itself. I'm giving you the abbreviated version, but in 2015, I was attending the uh, International Association of Endocrine Surgeons meeting in Bangkok. And this Thai surgeon no one had ever heard of presented um, his series his first 60 cases of transoral thyroidectomy. And he reported no complications, um, no nerve injuries, no hematomas. Um, and um, we're like, this is not possible. No one really believed the data. Um, and so um, he was making a decision in the oral vestibule tunneling down. So um, a group of us decided to go over the next following summer it's one of the uh, most rewarding academic trips I've been on, but we, um, uh, this is, uh, this is Dr. Ann uh, Ann Wong, the surgeon. Um, there's Gustavo, my partner in New York, uh, Insu Sa, he was at UCSF at the time. He's now at NYU, Kwan Du, UCSF, Dr. Wu, he's the head of the IRCOT in Taiwan, uh, Robin Sisko, she's at Stanford, um, and, and others. We had just an amazing day of watching him operate. And basically the problem with this is the mental nerve. Um, you worry about the mental nerve and um, the, the modification he made from, this was developed in China by a Chinese surgeon. The modification he made is he moved the um, incisions up higher and a little bit more lateral to the distal distribution. So the day we were there for a week, um, three operations a day, two in the morning, one in the afternoon, and we break for lunch um, every day. Um, the hotel was across the street from the hospital, transneural nasal intubation, and we immediately saw that this is a safe, reproducible uh, operation with the right team. His team, he held his hand out of blink. They knew exactly what he wanted in his hand. Really an amazing uh, setup. And uh, lots of high-level discussion uh, about how to do this, little details that are important. This is my first patient in New York um, about a month or two later. Um, she was actually scheduled for a BABA and... Um, elected to go to this other approach. And you can see here, um, this is just uh, 10 days after surgery that there's really the oral mucosa heals very well. So this is truly um, a scarless approach. So how do you do this? Um, you use standard laparoscopic instruments. Um, it's almost like the, the transcervical case it did in 1998, but just a little bit different. Um, you can see, again, you have to, we use a blunt dissector to make, um, uh, to, 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 to begin to develop the space below the strap muscles, but sorry, below the batisma, but above the strap muscles. And, um, and then you, you basically create the working space. Um, and this takes a little bit of time. So here the isthmus is being divided. put a hain suture in the um, strap muscles to retract them uh, laterally. Sorry, there's this was being divided. So this is like an upside down baba. Here the isthmus is divided. And rather than ending with dividing the superior pole, you take the superior pole down first and, um, and divide that. And then I usually find the recurrent nerve and when I do open thyroidectomy, um, low in the neck and then dissect it up towards the insertion site. But this approach is preferred to find the recurrent nerve at its insertion site. And once you find that, the operation is practically over. So you can see very gently, this is the right thyroid lobe. There's the first peak of the insertion site of the recurrent nerve. It's a nerve testing equipment. We can test, you can see the contractions of the vocalis muscle there. So we know that's a recurrent nerve. I confirm that's R1, right? That's the R1 signal. And then you make the window, drop the nerve down, and then divide that tissue uh, with your energy device. There you can see the nerve. Your thyroid gland. 
Did the other side as well. There's the other side, there's a recurrent nerve on the left side. And, uh, and then the specimen's placed in a retrieval sack and extracted. Uh, but with this, obviously, there's going to be some complications. Things happen. Uh, it's really important to know your outcomes. Um, so um, what are some of the elements that can contribute to this? I mean, I think there have been all sorts of case reports of horrific um, outcomes, as one might imagine. Overall, the experience has been pretty good. But I think when you have a non-MIS surgeon uh, trying to do use MIS techniques, uh, who doesn't know the principles of triangulation and whatnot that we do in the abdomen routinely, uh, that can lead to problems in the team dynamic, having a team to help take the stress out, to uh, be familiar with the, the equipment is important. Those are the familiar uh, complications, and uh, but there's a whole host of things that can happen with this approach that need to be disclosed to the patient. They often don't hear this. Um, I have one patient now who's very unhappy with, with persistent numbness uh, around the chin. Despite going through this and documenting it, they often don't hear it. So you gotta make sure your patients really are informed and understand things that can happen. And I think the mental nerve uh, is one that really needs to be um, counseled. Uh, it's transient in 90 plus percent of the patients, but in a small percentage, there will be persistent problems. Um, CO2 embolism, um, I've never seen this, but it's been reported and you need, need to know what to do. There can be anything from asymptomatic to vascular collapse. Um, and you want to put the patient in reverse from Dillenberg, left lateral to cutis position, obviously stop insufflating and then, um, and then open it and do the operation with the open manner. Um, there's been some skin problems. Um, this is a patient with Graves disease. You can see the red dots is my, my personal series are total thyroidectomies. This is my 51st case. <clears throat> and she didn't tell me she was an ongoing smoker. Um, and so she was smoking and um, at day 21, she had a coughing fit and developed uh, a hematoma. She was normal at day seven, but day 22, I saw her in the office and um, she had this swelling, <clears throat> did an ultrasound that looked just like you know old blood. So I put her on antibiotics, Nasterceus in 48 hours. Um, she didn't follow up. She was still orally hyperthyroid and a little bit crazy from her, her hyperthyroidism. <clears throat> she presented a week later um, with a serious soft tissue infection. Um, and I would say I won't say this is life threatening, but this is this is a big deal. Um, and so here she has this, this tissue infection we took her to the OR, made a small submental incision, basically evacuated, you know, pus, and then put in a couple of Jackson Pratt drains. And this is in the office, uh, 10 days later, uh, she ultimately had a, a decent outcome, but you know, you have to be aware. I'd never seen anything like this before that when you're doing novel things, uh, strange things can happen and you need to really know your data and follow your patients closely. Um, so if you want to do this, how do you do this? Um, you know, I think attending a course, I think in-person observation is imperative. It's really important. Um, if you can get a proctor to come when you're doing your first case um, and just make sure that you really follow your patients closely. So this is my final slide. A few take home points. We talked about, um, reviewed sort of the, the changes in thyroid cytology uh, and staging. Um, and there's been an evolution of this sort of static to dynamic risk assessment Hopefully you, you've got a good broad overview of this topic, but there's a lot more there underneath the surface. Uh, and hopefully some of you will be interested to do some more investigation in that. And then around innovation, um, I think you have to adhere to the principles of surgery. When you're introducing new techniques or new technology, you want to make sure you don't compromise what you're there to treat. Invest in the team. I think having a, a team of partners, a team in the operating room uh, is invaluable. And strive to be a lifelong learner. I mean, that's what we do. You're here, you're learning, but once you leave here, leave these um, esteemed doors that uh, continue to, to educate yourself and ask questions, be curious, and continue to learn. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Downs. It's really fascinating lecture. We have uh, a little bit of time, or we don't really have time, but I'm going to ask Dr. Javid uh, for your questions and comments. I love the opportunity. It's very helpful to the audience. We have a question, uh, many, <laughs> but let's say sticking to the conventional and the narrowing we have. How much information do you recommend giving the patient? 
you know, sometimes people come in and they've been told, oh, it's a TV, it's a scenario, you'll just pop it out, or take out the nodule, it's a cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, especially for the part of maybe the big, the big brain goiter, or maybe a cancer to get the nerve might be involved. How much detail do you go into to discuss maybe stopping and saving the medication and all the rest of the brain Yeah, it's good. Following so Dr. Javid asked about, for those who were at Zoom, couldn't hear the question, just about complications and how, how informed consent, how you, how much information do you give to a patient? Well, that, that's where the art of surgery comes into play, that you're not really taught in a textbook. Um, and I always, when I'm working with students and residents, I always talk about sitting at the eye level of the patient, sitting down at their level. And you have to adjust your delivery based on the patient. Now, practice in New York was fascinating because in my clinic, one patient could be a homeless person from Harlem. The next patient could be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. The next patient could be from the Ukraine or Russia. The next patient could be from, uh, you know, Hispanic origin from the Central America. And the Russians, they don't want to know the word cancer. They don't want the family member to know. They don't want to know that they have cancer. So, but as a physician, I have to tell them they have cancer. I cannot get around that. So you work with the family to come up with a way to deliver the information that maintains their dignity and respects their culture. But the Hispanic culture, they will, everyone wants to know they have cancer. They want to cry together. They want to, you know, they want to, they want to be involved. And so that's a little bit of the answer. That's the art of how we practice and delivering the information. Now, Eastern Kentucky, we have, you know, all sorts of, of challenges in relaying information. So I really, again, adjust the delivery of information based on uh, the patient, what I think they can understand, giving them enough. Uh, in simple terms, it, you know, if they're illiterate, for example, uh, that can be complicated. Now, Dr. Lee, my partner, does a, about a one-hour informed consent. She he is the most, I'm, I'm exaggerating, she gives the most thorough informed consent of anyone I've ever met, um, and she's to be commended on that. I have a little bit different tact. Um, I'm very precise, or try to be anyway, to the point, but my delivery is tailored to the individual basically. Um, and I, I don't go into staging. They're there because they trust us. And if I come out and say, listen, there's been a problem. Um, I've transected the recurrent lingual nerve uh, because of blank. Um, here's what we're going to do. The patient, not always, but usually trusts us. And um, you know, we, we get around it that way. Dr. Quillo. Yeah, very interesting talk. Thank you. And just hearing all the updates and uh, both the cancer side and also the technology. I guess my question is time wise, um, with the newer technology, I, I'm sure over time it gets faster and faster, but it seems like taking a fairly straightforward procedure and adding a lot of time and, and effort. So, um, have you found that you can get your time over the time that you've done the procedure down to sort of open? Um, it's a question about duration of surgery, some of the newer techniques. Clearly, early on, um, they take a long time. My first case, I had two partners with me um, in the operating room, so we did it together, and uh, it took two hours. It was a low back to me. The next case took three hours, um, and you saw my operative times there. They're they're up and down, um, but you know the main thing is safety, um, uh, methodical approach to the operation, anatomy, and so forth. And occasionally you'll get stumped and, and get stuck. Um, but yes, it takes a little bit longer. Uh, I'd like to say, though, that this is a very small minority of what we do. Most of our operations are done open. In fact, in Kentucky, many patients don't want any of these techniques. So actually, my personal involvement with this has actually lessened over, over time. I have done several of these in Kentucky, but it's it, it's a very different patient population than the Upper East Side of Manhattan. That's what I'm curious about. Yeah. Don't want any of them. You've learned the, the down home wisdom of Kentucky. <laughs> I love the Kentucky patients. Though. I mean, I say that with with all respect, though. I love the Kentucky patients. So I'm here. Right. We uh, we're gonna take a quick break. Five minutes Thanks. maximum. We get back for two hours. Oh, wait, we didn't say that. I'm going to give you the gift. All right. Now, Julianne, she gives a great grandma. She's seven times. All right, here's your uh, tulip cup. You can learn how to do it. Yes.
Thank you. I'm sure that's all we ever need to do now. Is okay, that's all right, can I just do that? Um, 